skills you need to succeed today. I'm so excited that you've decided to invest your time in our course for a professional diploma in candle making. Over the duration of these modules, we will be covering candle production setup, basic and advanced candle making, candle customization, as well as how to market your candle making business. Welcome to your professional diploma in candle making and lesson two of the first module of this course. Today is the day you'll begin to feel like a professional candle artisan because by the end of this lesson, you will have learned the words and phrases used by the masters when referring to their craft. As with many art forms and trades, there is a very specific vocabulary used to communicate processes, to describe detail, and to explain certain outcomes. Candle making is no exception. A very important component of becoming proficient and being able to convey this proficiency in any skill is to have a thorough knowledge of the vocabulary. Correct vocabulary is critical in understanding and also communicating within a specific sphere. Today we will be learning some of the most important words and terms used in the candle making world. This information is fundamental to your success in this industry. You'll find we will be using this language throughout this course to reinforce your understanding and confidence in these terms. During this lesson, we are going to discuss the following objectives. Identifying the anatomy of the candle. Articulating terms for the raw materials and equipment. Differentiating between candle making terms. And discerning between post-production occurrences and phrases. Did you know? NASA scientists questioned what a burning candle would look like in microgravity. Candle flames come to an upward point like a teardrop as a result of gravity. The hot air rising from the flame is constantly being replaced with cooler air at the base of the wick, known as a convection current. In outer space, however, in the absence of gravity to perform this function, a candle flame presents itself as a blue circle on the tip of the wick. With nothing pulling the flame upward, it stays perfectly round and blue. Our first topic in this lesson is to look at how to identify the anatomy of the candle. To do that, we need to know how does a candle actually work? To discuss and name the anatomy of a candle, we need to first understand what the science is behind the burning of a candle. Candle wax is pretty much made up of hydrogen and carbon, making them hydrocarbons. As a candle is lit, the flame heats the wax surrounding the wick and essentially sucks the molten wax up the wick. The high temperature of the flame warms this liquefied wax, causing it to transform into a gas. This in turn causes the hydrogen and carbon to begin breaking down. The reaction between these elements and the oxygen they encounter is what causes heat and light to become apparent. Knowing the scientific process occurring in the candle, let's do a more in-depth analysis of the structure of the flame. Now that we understand how a candle works, we can look at the actual structure of the flame which appears when a candle is lit. The lower portion of a candle is simply solid wax. Above that, you will find the molten wax which has been warmed by the flame. The really intricate part is everything happening above that in the flame itself. When looking at a candle flame closely, you'll notice that the portion lowest on the wick appears blue and is referred to as the blue zone. This area is full of oxygen and this is where your hydrocarbon molecules split into their separate atoms. Just above the blue zone, you'll find a brown or orange section, also known as the dark zone. This area of our flame doesn't contain much oxygen and is where the last of our hydrocarbon atoms break down. This results in the area just above it where you will begin to see the wick blacken because of the carbon atoms hardening. In the bottom half of our next section, the yellow zone, there is an even greater buildup of soot particles. While rising, they get hotter and hotter and ultimately result in the luminous flame we see. Around the edges of the yellow flame and extending all the way down to the blue zone at the base is another very thin blue area, which is also known as the veil. This is where the flame comes into direct contact with oxygen, 
and is the hottest portion of the flame. This unassuming area can reach up to 1400 degrees Celsius. Let's now begin looking at how to articulate the terms we use to describe certain raw materials and equipment. We'll begin by speaking about the terms relating specifically to raw materials. Additives are the products or ingredients we add to our melted wax to transform the outcome of the candle. These could potentially include color dyes, fragrances, or certain other chemicals to prolong the burn time. These additives are how we would achieve results like a colored candle, for instance. Beeswax sheets are a very special form of wax. They're also called foundation sheets because their primary function is to be used in beehives to attract scout honeybees. These scout bees will then hopefully see this space as a new hive and encourage them to start a colony and begin production there. For the purposes of this course though, our main interest in these pre-made sheets of beeswax is that they are a wonderful way to make a simple beeswax candle. They are already molded into a very distinct hexagonal pattern and are thin, pliable, and exceptionally aesthetically pleasing. Essential oils are those potent smelling oils extracted from plant materials via distillation. They are entirely natural, highly concentrated fragrances smelling strongly of their plant of origin and contain no chemical additives. Owing to their natural source, they also encompass various healing and health promoting properties depending on the specific oil. They're a favorite choice of people attempting to live using less chemical and artificial products. Fragrance oils, not to be confused with essential oils, are those additives that we will use to give scent to a candle. They might be partly made up of a natural component, but are not entirely naturally derived. Fragrance oils can contain natural ingredients, but will also have a certain chemical component to them. Unless specifically stated, one doesn't always know if, say, lavender oil is an essential oil or a fragrance oil, but when you start encountering bottles with names like cupcake and spice chai, you can be sure this is not an essential oil. The term primed refers to whether or not a wick has been pre-treated with wax or oil so that it can be used to produce a candle. A wick that hasn't been primed will contain air, which will affect the burning. We prime our wicks to eliminate the air and improve on the burning quality. A core candle is a basic, normally uncolored, unscented candle used as the foundation for an over-dipping process or to be used in candle carving. With core referring to the center or inside of something, it explains itself rather well. These candles will make up the core of a larger candle. Let's move on to some of the terminology we'll be using to describe our equipment. A double boiler is a vessel you will be using every time you melt the wax. What these are, are pots that rest inside one another with a layer of water in between. The water is heated inside the outside pot, thus preventing the second pot which holds your wax from having a direct heat source applied to it. The wax in the upper pot is instead then melted by the steam that rises from the lower pot. Something helpful to note is that one doesn't necessarily need to invest in an actual double boiler. Any two heat resistant pots or jugs could be used to create this nested effect. I myself use one of my regular cooking pots to hold the water and then place a glass kitchen jug into it. Molds are the empty structured shape used to contain melted wax in a specific form. The melted wax will set inside them in the specific shape modeled by the mold. These molds can be made of metal, plastic, silicone, and a variety of other heat and water resistant materials. Initially, molds were very plain and mostly used to make pillar candles and the larger based candles not possible via dipping. Nowadays though, the varieties are endless. Molds can be bought in the shape of virtually anything you want, from Christmas trees to Buddha replicas and human formed ones too. Now for a multiple choice question. Which of the following items would not be considered an additive when referring to candle making? 
Would it be A, a double boiler, B, essential oil, C, fragrance oil? If you recognize the answer, you can pop it into Morpheus. The correct answer to this question is A, a double boiler. This is a piece of candle making equipment and not an additive. Now let's look at some candle making terms and how to differentiate between them. The term flash point is a very important one to pay attention to. The flash point of vapor is the temperature at which it will catch light if it encounters a spark or open flame. This is a crucial point to keep in mind when considering shipping or transporting a candle. Items having a very low flash point, meaning that they are very easily ignited, may result in there being restrictions on how your candle can be transported. Thinking about the term very rationally, this wording can be easily remembered as it tells you exactly what it's saying. It is literally the point at which you'd see a flash or spark as something ignites. It's a term that in its very words feels like a warning to me, like lightning breaking the sky and catching your attention. We speak about a melt point or melting point when we refer to the temperature at which wax will begin transforming from a solid substance to a liquid. This is exceptionally important for us to know because it relates to the timing of multiple things such as when we need to stop heating our wax and at what point we can pour it. This leads us to our pouring temperature. This you're going to be hearing a lot about. It is the temperature of warm melted wax at which it is recommended that it be added to a mold or container. Pouring wax that is either too hot or too cold will certainly have an effect on the aesthetic or functionality of your candle. Next up are relief holes. These are created by a technique we employ during the candle making process, where tunnels are poked into a candle after the first wax pour. You do this by using a stick to prod right down to the bottom of the candle where the wax is partially set. This alleviates any air pockets that may be forming and prepares the candle for the second pour of wax. The scent load, which is also known as the fragrance load, refers to how much fragrance can be added to a specific quantity of wax. Normally, we'll speak about the percentage of fragrance that can be added to the melted wax. So for instance, if we know we have 100 milliliters of molten wax and the fragrance load of that specific wax is 6%, then we know we can safely add 6 milliliters of fragrance to that quantity of wax. There is an optimum scent load for each different type of wax and sticking to these guidelines will ultimately have an effect on the success or failure of your candle. When using a mold to make a candle, a section of the wick will protrude from the bottom of the mold towards the outside. Naturally, this means there will be a small opening where wax could potentially leak out. In order to stop this leakage, we make use of a mold sealer. A mold sealer can really be any malleable adhesive substance that can be placed over the wick extending from the bottom of a mold. I generally use putty intended for household use like sticking things to walls. I've also heard of people using plumbing putty and their children's play-doh. This should give you an idea of the kind of texture you're looking for. You can also buy professional silicone mold sealer off sites like Amazon.com. Any of these will act as a mold sealer and prevent wax from leaking out of the tiny gap at the bottom of your candle. The term grubby describes a certain type of fairly old-fashioned candle. These aren't made regularly anymore, but I like how the term reminds me of my mother referring to me as a child after a good day's play in the dirt. This method of candle making is done by rolling a half-set candle in spices, coffee grounds, sand, or virtually anything else that creates a textured outer for the candle. A water bath is a vessel of water normally used as an aid when creating dipped candles. A metal container of cold water is placed next to the pot heating the wax. The wick, after each dip in the wax, can be alternately dipped in the cold water to cause it to harden and seal before adding its next layer of wax. This placing in cold water causes the wax to cool more rapidly and helps to speed up the process of making the candle. We've already covered so much information today. 
Let's take a moment to rest our minds before we continue with this exciting lesson. And while we do that, I'll introduce lesson three to you. In our next lesson together, we're going to be engaging in a practical lesson and creating our very first candle. So don't forget to attend your third class to keep building on the skills you've already obtained today. For now though, let's get back to lesson two and finish off with our next topic. In this last section, we'll speak about the different terms that are used for results occurring after the creation process of the candle. Curing is the very important process of leaving a candle to stand and settle for a period after it has been made. This curing period allows the wax to really integrate with any fragrances you may have added and to be fully allowed to set. This will provide an optimum burning experience once the candle is lit. The curing is in actual fact a chemical process where dyes and fragrances become locked into the wax. The only exception is fragrance oil which does not bind chemically. It merely becomes stuck between minuscule layers of hardened wax. Making and then burning a candle immediately is never recommended, so be sure to always give yourself adequate time for your creation to cure. Chatter marks, which are also referred to as jump lines or stuttering, are banded lines that form on the outside of a candle that has set. This can sometimes happen if the wax was poured into a container that was too cold, or the wax being poured was too cold. These chatter marks don't affect the performance of your candle in any way, but they do detract from the overall pleasing visual effect you may be going for. Frosting is a term we use to describe a phenomenon very common in soy and paraffin wax candles. This frosting doesn't affect the function of the candle in any way. It's merely a powdery effect on the surface of the wax, which sometimes resembles a snowflake. This effect may be more prominent in colored candles than in their undyed counterparts, simply because the frosting is a powdery shade that will be less visible on a neutrally colored object. Bloom, which is such a pretty way to describe something that is actually seen as a flaw, is similar to frosting, but it refers to the phenomenon in beeswax candles. Like with frosting, bloom presents as a powdery substance on the surface of beeswax candles. This occurs because natural oils in the beeswax will inevitably gravitate towards the top surface of the wax. It's far more easily remedied than frosting though. All one needs to do to fix it is to wipe it gently with a soft cloth. Overdipping is the practice of placing a candle, generally one that is made in a mold, into warm wax again and again to build up layers of wax and increase the size or alter the color. The term overdipping always felt to me like it indicated dipping that had gone too far or too much dipping. The term is, however, straightforward and literally refers to dipping a candle that is technically complete over and over again, thus giving it an overdip. Sinkholes are a very common sight in candles and they form when the wax has been allowed to cool and shrink. When the wax cools, it always loses volume to an extent. This contraction of the wax causes deep crevices to form from the surface of the candle downwards, thereby creating a sinkhole. Let's see how much you are remembering with a multiple choice question. How would you refer to the phenomenon of the powdery residue occurring on a candle that looks like the one in this image? Would it be A, sinkholes, B, the flashpoint, C, overdipping, or D, frosting? The correct answer is D, frosting, a very common phenomenon in soy and paraffin wax candles. Let's look at how we would discern some of the phrases used to describe post-production occurrences in candles. Mushrooming is a very common occurrence in cotton wicked candles. A collection of carbon builds up at the tip of the wick when it has been burning for too long of a time. This creates a very distinct mushroom shape at the tip of the candle wick. It usually causes the candle to give off a large amount of smoke and sometimes shoot small pieces of soot onto the surrounding surfaces. For this reason, amongst others, it is incredibly important to trim your wick before each lighting of your candle. Prevention of mushrooming is very important when cultivating a functional burn. 
The term burn rate and burn time indicate two separate things which can easily be confused. Burn rate refers to how much wax on a given candle is burned through in one hour. Burn time, however, refers to the overall length of time that a candle should burn for. Ideally, we'd like our burn rate to be as low as possible, allowing for a very small amount of wax to be consumed and thereby making the total burn time of one candle far longer. A burn cycle is another similar term that we also need to distinguish from the other two. This relates more to the practice of wick testing when we conduct burn tests, something that will be discussed at a later stage in this course. A burn cycle is generally a four hour period where the candle is allowed to burn undisturbed and is then extinguished and allowed to cool. One would most likely light it again after this to evaluate various aspects of the candle's performance. When we speak about the term cold throw, we are referring to the scent emanating from a scented candle when it isn't lit. For instance, when you're in a shop and open a jar candle to sniff the fragrance, the scent you are smelling would be the cold throw. This can be stronger or weaker depending on the specific candle and how well it was made. I'm sure we all know someone who refuses to burn their fragrance candles because they're afraid that burning them might somehow ruin that smell that radiates from the perfect unlit product. Hot throw, as I'm sure you'll now be able to guess, refers to the fragrance released from a burning candle. That warm exotic smell that reaches you as you enter a room before you even realize its source. That is your hot throw scent. The hot throw of a candle can also be a mark of how well it has been made and fragranced according to how far reaching the scent is throughout the room. The more generalized term of scent throw encompasses both hot and cold throws which we discussed earlier. It relates to the amount of scent given off by the candle and how widely it is distributed. The melt pool is something we will speak of frequently throughout this course. This is the liquefied wax that radiates outward from the wick when a candle has begun to burn. The longer you burn your candle, the larger your melt pool will become. Dependent on your wick size though, the melt pool should have finite boundaries and not grow past a certain point. Tunneling is a phenomenon that occurs when a candle has been lit but not allowed the time to form a complete burn pool before being extinguished. It refers to the tunnel that forms when a candle burns straight down the center of the wax, as opposed to having it burn evenly from the top to the bottom. This is not a desirable characteristic and something we will aim to learn how to prevent when we begin making our candles. I love this word, the afterglow. This is the light that appears in the wick after the candle has been extinguished. It usually remains for several moments before extinguishing itself. While not an enormous flaw, having an afterglow is in fact not a desirable quality in a candle wick. You should always check extinguished candles for this to prevent unintended reignition of the candle. The term adhesion is also referred to as wet spots, pull away, and delamination. This phenomenon can be spotted most commonly in soy and paraffin wax candles when the candle is being made in a transparent vessel, a glass for example. It will appear as small air bubbles behind the glass where it is clear that the wax hasn't stuck to the internal glass. Pouring and heating methods could be the source of this occurrence and we'll be discussing this in more depth at a later point. Our last term for today is the gutter. This speaks to the overflow of wax that pours down the outside of a candle. While a small amount of guttering is normal in a lit candle, some, usually owing to overwicking, show excessive guttering and therefore wasted wax and burning time. Here's another multiple choice question to test your memory. If you were to see a candle like the one pictured here, with a broad rim of wax and a hole directly down the center, which term will you use to describe the phenomenon? A. The melt pool. B. Tunneling. C. Guttering. Or D. Burn cycle. The correct answer to this question is B. Tunneling.
something that occurs when a full burn pool isn't allowed and a wick burns downwards too quickly.